And you're coming up on the intersection of faith and reason, Father Spitzer's Universe. I'm Doug Keck, directing traffic here at our studios at EWTN in Irondale, Alabama, where it all began back in 1981 when Mother Angelica had the sense of this mission. And we carry it on as best we can each week on this program and all of the programs here on EWTN. And don't forget, without you, we can't do this show. So email us your questions. You can check us out on Facebook. You can tweet us on Twitter. You can go to the Magis Center website for Father Spitzer's materials and also CredibleCatholic.com, which is what we're working through week by week on this particular program. Also, speaking of uh, great thinkers, we have Paul Body, who wrote a wonderful book, Benedict Up Close, the inside story of eight dramatic years about uh, Pope Emeritus, uh, obviously Pope Benedict, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger beforehand, and obviously his tenure as, as Pope before his uh, retirement. And so it's a wonderful book published by EWTN uh, Publishing. We'd like you to check it out. EWTNRC.com is a place to find it. Again, the book Benedict Up Close. So look for an interview coming soon that I did with him on this book. With that said, we turned to another great author and our friend out on the West Coast at Christ Cathedral, where upcoming shortly, there's going to be actually the whole events happening there that you'll be participating in as well, right? You bet. Uh, it'll be just great. Uh, Matt Bunsen and Brian Patrick, and uh, uh, we'll be uh, talking about the opening of our brand new cathedral called the Christ Cathedral. It, it's on the campus of what used to be called the Crystal Cathedral, and uh, it should be uh, fantastic. I've seen the inside. Uh, I, I use the term C loosely, mm -hmm. right. uh, but um, uh, I've uh, been on the inside and had the whole thing described to me. It, it's a, a wonderful cathedral, so stay tuned on the uh, 17th for the opening, and I'll be there with you and uh, with Matt Bunsen and B right. Brian Patrick. Right, and we'll have a preview show the night before, and then we'll have something right before the event, which you'll be participating in, and then we'll have coverage of the event itself. We, we thank Bishop Van and the whole uh, Archdiocese for letting us spend our time and work with you directly there at the Christ Cathedral campus, and this is something that they've all worked on, Tim Bush, and many other people out there have been worked over you the bet. years to make this happen. So with that being said, if you'd like to uh, start us off with a prayer, Father. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all your blessings. The blessing especially of this ministry, our ability to serve your people, your kingdom, your church. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon Doug, myself, and our whole audience this day so that whatever we say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray Amen. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, that was an uplifting prayer, though our first topic for today is going to be on hell, uh, out of your credible <laughs> Catholic. Uh, but we think what, this is probably going to take us, you, me, and Dante, a little while to get through uh, oh, yeah. this uh, <laughs> over the next couple of weeks. So, uh, but before mm -hmm. we get that, before we get to some questions from prior programs, I wanted to mention this. You know, our, our great friend, uh, Archbishop Charles Chaput of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. has been on EWTN's yeah. board. I think he's the longest serving EWTN board member back in a time when Mother Angelica was still active at the network. Uh -huh. And he gave a talk recently, and I thought this was interesting because it was talking about Catholics in the public square, but it was also talking about the whole idea of atheism, agnosticism, and secularization, which you deal with so much with young people. So I want to read this. I thought it was a really great quote. Any claim uh -huh. that atheists, agnostics, and a secularized intelligentsia are naturally more rational than religious believers is nonsense. We're all believers. There are no unbelievers. Atheists just worship a smaller and less forgiving God at a different altar. Is that how you see it? 
Oh, uh, absolutely. And of course, uh, as pithy as, uh, you know, Archbishop Chaput is, uh, that one was as pithy as it gets. That, that was great and well stated. He gets it from both angles. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first uh, angle, of course, is, yeah, we're uh, believers are, uh, in the sense of uh, theistic believers, believers in God, Christianity, Catholicism, are, are just as rational as, as non-believers. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the statistics show that that. Uh, uh, the Pew survey, in, you know, uh, they uh, uh, basically had a gigantic survey of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and um, uh, AAAS membership has a, uh, you know, uh, a special uh, division mm -hmm. for just religion and, and science, mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, headed up by Jennifer Wiseman. And, and so uh, in that division, uh, you know, you can see already how many scientists are participating in this dialogue, but anyway, the Pew survey did a did a um, uh, you know uh, analysis of that membership, and 51 percent of the scientists uh, declared themselves to be uh, theistic, mm -hmm. while uh, 40 percent uh, declared themselves to be atheistic. Mm -hmm. So clearly, <laughs> um, scientists are, are uh, uh, believers in God, no question, and certainly mm -hmm. more of them uh, than than are atheistic. And then you know the uh, the National Center for Disease Control. Uh, did a, a huge survey of physicians, and uh, turns out 88% of physicians are religiously affiliated, and of that 88%, 67% are moderately or highly affiliated with their churches. So the first thing is, hey, wait a minute here. It's not that just uh, scientists and, 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 uh, and uh, 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 physicians are the mm -hmm. intelligentsia, but let's face it, uh, they reflect a, a good swath of the population of, of intelligentsia. So, I mean, uh, uh, certainly, uh, you know, the people I associate with too, uh, many of them, you know, uh, have uh, uh, master's degrees, PhDs, and, and so forth, and, and they're unashamedly uh, religious believers, and, and this is just, of course, that's just anecdotal, mm -hmm. but the surveys show, I mean, let's face it, rational people, scientific people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, physicians, medical people, etc., uh, are, are very much uh, believers in God, and, and, and uh, among the physicians, certainly, um, you know, are, are profound believers. By the way, mm -hmm. it's interesting, you know, this uh, Louis Finkelstein, uh, Institute also surveyed physicians, you know, um, about whether or not uh, a miracle could happen. Mm -hmm. And 70 percent shockingly responded. They believed that not only could a miracle happen uh, in the past, but in uh, today as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, let's face it, uh, that, that's the, the base, uh, uh, you know, and, and intelligentsia are certainly, certainly mm -hmm. Uh, more clued in scientific intelligence mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and so forth. Now there may be some uh, you know uh, currents in in uh, you know liberal arts uh, areas of of some secular universities that are are not uh, you know. Uh, uh, in, in league with uh, belief in God, but there are plenty of them uh, mm -hmm. who are also in league with belief in God. Interestingly enough, uh, that that's more you know common in the liberal arts than it is in engineering, mm -hmm. in in science, and in business. So I I, I just rest my case. We we have a. Uh, a huge swath of people. And of course, what Archbishop Chaput is referring to there is, uh, well, it all depends on what you mean by belief. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so all of us are believers as well. And, and, and so it's, um, uh, we, we believe in our particular case uh, uh, in, in, uh, in a God that is uh, not only uh, exists and is present to us, mm -hmm. but is loving indeed. And, and people who are agnostic or atheistic uh, tend to believe that if God did exist, uh, he, he wouldn't be loving. Mm -hmm. and, and so, of course, it's a much narrower view of God. And uh, Archbishop uh, Chaput has really stated it pithily and beautifully, uh, right on the marker. Um, you know, uh, we're all believers, and frankly, believers in God mm -hmm. are a, a heavy swath mm -hmm. of very rational, scientific, f uh, physicians, right. philosophical-oriented uh, people. And the church itself mm -hmm. is filled, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, not only with uh, 
you know, uh, an intelligentsia right. that runs uh, the largest international university system in the world, bar none, is run by the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so there's intelligentsia uh, that are clearly present and believing in God and, and, and teaching this within the confines uh, of academe mm -hmm. and, and the academy. And so, the, you know, we also see, you know, that the Papal Academy uh, of Sciences is filled with Nobel Prize winners. Mm -hmm. and, and still the Vatican runs, uh, you know, an observatory, which is not only active, but, but participating in, in first-rate science. And as I said, the AAAS has its own division mm -hmm. of, of uh, religion and science in it. That's a, uh, the Association uh, for uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. And so for all uh, intents and purposes, we're, uh, 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 Archbishop Chaput right. is 1,000% oh. on board. The statistics verify it. And our view of belief just happens well, to be a lot more open and loving than the, the right. more restricted right. one of and, agnostics. And it does seem to be, uh, you know, kind of like that, that contrarian idea that, that the church uh, gets accused of being overly dogmatic that it seems to be more and more, at least what we're, we see in the news and things, this kind of uh, secular idea that th there, there seems to be a series of doctrines that they all adhere to. Well, exactly. I mean, f let's face facts. Secularism today is much more dogmatic mm -hmm. than the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it, it, you know, I'm not just talking about the PC movement. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm talking about what you can and can't believe in a university system. Y you ought to really, uh, w uh, you know, I wish a sociologist would sit down, and I think Jordan Peterson has already broached this right. uh, pretty significantly, uh, where he's just looking at the dogmatism uh, within the uh, the confines uh, of the university system and secular culture in general, and he's just uh, putting it to the test. He's he's pushing the boundaries, uh, no question, and responding to it very critically. He doesn't do it from a uh, you know a, a god center point of view. He does it though from the, the vantage point of just plain uh, secular morality. So when he his critique is utterly devastating, but it's a critique of the new secular dogmatism. Mm -hmm. and, and I think everybody should be uh, aware of that, Doug, and you're right on the mm -hmm. marker. I mean, uh, secular dogmatism oftentimes is not only far more dogmatic, mm -hmm. but it is far more forcefully dogmatic mm -hmm. uh, than uh, religious, uh, so-called religious dogmatism. Right, it's interesting. Okay, let's get to some questions from uh, previous programs. Uh, mm -hmm. Before we get to the second half, talking about hell. Yes, it does exist. We'll talk <laughs> about that later. Uh, yes. Dear Father Spitzer, uh, could you explain Jesus' exhortation of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me when he was being crucified? Thank you, and this is Jim. Hey, Jim, that, that is a really excellent question. It gets right to the heart of what's going on there. Unfortunately, a lot of people, when they see this passage in Mark's Gospel and Matthew's Gospel, it's not in Luke and John uh, because, you know, they're, they're uh, actually uh, writing for predominantly Gentile audiences and they wouldn't have gotten it. Uh, but Matthew is writing for a Jewish audience and Mark is writing uh, for mostly Jewish audience. Mm -hmm. And so what you have there is, you know, a, a lot of people think, oh my gosh, Jesus is having a panic attack on right, the cross, right, right. Right? right? Jesus is having a, a confidence attack in, mm -hmm. in, in God. And, and it, it, there's nothing of that in there. Uh, that's a, an improper interpretation of basically a, a, a text that's being written from a Jewish perspective. Uh, as you, uh, as Jim, you are implying, um, Jesus is actually saying Psalm 22 on the cross. He's not having a panic attack. He's basically quoting a psalm. And as you already imply, uh, um, uh, Jim, you have to read the entire psalm. So when you, in, in Jewish terms, mm -hmm. the way to refer to the whole psalm, they didn't have a numeration system like Psalm 22, right? So what did the cantor do uh, in, in a temple synagogue setting? He would say the first line of the psalm. And then, of course, everybody would go, oh, it's that psalm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, coming from the antiphon, then they would join in and say the rest of the psalm. Now, uh, what's interesting about Psalm 22 uh, is that it's not a psalm 
of shattered confidence, right? So if you just begin, it begins with a lamentation, which is very typical of a lamentation psalm, right? Jesus is hurting. He picks this lamentation psalm, but he picks this one because it's a very special lamentation psalm. Because by the time you get to verse number three, what you're seeing is that the psalm turns on its head. Mm -hmm. It begins, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And then all of a sudden it says, but I have confidence that you're going to, to, to help your servant. I know that you're going to redeem your servant. I know that you're going to, uh, you know, uh, bring, I've seen you and your works in the past and, and, and so forth. So he's recounting this and he's saying, I have confidence you're going to bring good out of this. And now, this is why Jesus chooses this psalm, right? But believe me, before he went to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. Jesus chose Psalm 22. He knew what was going to happen to him. He had his dying words picked out. He picked out Psalm 22, not only because it's a psalm of confidence, not a psalm of despair. It's a psalm of confidence. But then in the second part of three parts of the psalm, we have a detailed uh, sort of explanation mm -hmm. of a man who is going through a crucifixion that is uh, not a crucifixion but a a terrible trial and torment that's very very closely related to Jesus's crucifixion his tongue is sticking to the roof of his mouth people are jeering at him and wagging their fingers outside people are you know are are beating <clears throat> him and pulling mm -hmm. on his beard <clears throat> and as you're looking at this uh, psalm from the outside, you're going, my gosh, <clears throat> this thing was written uh, between 500 and 1,000 years before Jesus. How in the world did the author know? I mean, it is so prophetic, and Jesus chooses it because it is so prophetic as to, you know, what right. is about to befall him and what is befalling him. So then you have that explication of, of you know, basically what's going on. And then in the third part of the psalm, you have the interpretation of what's going on. So what's going on? Why does the just man have to suffer? Un, uh, you know, an unjust punishment. And, and that's basically the question that's presented after part two. And the answer is so that all nations, and this is given in the psalm, right? So that all nations will be coming to the Lord, mm -hmm. will be coming to Yahweh, will be coming to God. Mm -hmm. and, and why is that important? <clears throat> because, of course, Jesus has said time and time again, I am replacing the temple in Jerusalem. I will become the cornerstone of the new temple, <clears throat> of the new church. And through me, <clears throat> everyone will come. All universe, right. the, the universal uh, group will come and will be part of uh, <clears throat> the worship of the one God. So he is the new temple. He is the one <clears throat> that's becoming uh, the universal temple, and of course everyone will come through him. <clears throat> but not only that, sins will be forgiven mm -hmm. through the suffering of the just man. The just man <clears throat> will take the place of um, all the unjust people, and by him being a just person, and innocently taking the place <clears throat> of the unjust people, he will take the punishment onto himself that would have been due <clears throat> for all people. Now, right. that's the sacrificial mentality. But Jesus, of course, is saying, I give myself in an unconditional act of love for you. And at the very end of the psalm, what's going to happen? <clears throat> it's not just going to be the redemption of Jewish people. It's going to be the redemption of the Gentiles. Right there, the people of the sea, the people of the nations are going to come. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it's not just going to be the present generation, but all past generations will come. Those who are down in the dust in the land of Sheol. <clears throat> and not just the past and the, and the present, but all future generations will come to the Lord. So it's about universal redemption. Mm -hmm. That's <clears throat> the purpose of the just man suffering, to forgive the sins of many and to become the cornerstone stone of the new temple in himself, the new universal church for the worship of God through him. Okay. And that's, Jesus chooses it really, really 
purposefully okay so, because of its amazing coincidence so, thank you Jay. Okay, very good okay so let's uh, move on to another mm -hmm. question a little different uh, this one may be straightforward in some ways dear father I work with people with advanced dementia I'm told that the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. can be working in these souls but wouldn't this also yeah. mean that the devil can do the same what if these souls are in mm -hmm. serious sin or have no faith and can no longer help themselves free will and reason appear to be long gone what is the most effective way I can help these souls to heaven this would be Mary Ellen Mary Ellen I would tell you this right now they still have free will mm -hmm. and they still have rationality the problem <clears throat> in their souls and and I've got a whole argument for this but uh, and, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment called terminal lucidity but for the moment <clears throat> do not assume that they do not have rationality um, that they do not have free will they can't manifest their free will and their rationality through their brain so their brain does have uh, you know uh, you know uh, plaques in it and uh, you know amyloid protein plaques that are uh, clearly you know clogging things up uh, their brain is not working well indeed in many cases of dementia there's atrophying of the brain which is quite significant now these would prevent the brain from channeling as it were the free will which is appropriate to the soul uh, which is channeling that dimension of what we call conceptual rationality which I think is appropriate to the soul and not just myself but mm -hmm. you know the Nobel Prize winning physiologist Sir John Eccles who presents a really good argument for this in the evolution of the brain colon creation of the self and and there's a you know many other people that that are talking about the transphysical nature of, of, of intellectual consciousness but my point that I'm trying to get mm -hmm. to is I think there is very good cause for believing mm -hmm. um, uh, both rationally and certainly there's good cause for uh, um, for a believing through faith mm -hmm. that uh, that person who has even radical dementia uh, uh, Alzheimer's that they do have a rational soul it's just not manifest they do have free will it's just not manifest mm -hmm. that they can hear you and, and and of course not only hear you but they can react to the data which you are presenting so uh, just assume that they can hear and, and somehow in their soul even though they can't register it mm -hmm. even though they have very little verbal production capacity just think of it this way that those individuals really are hearing really are reacting and can freely choose in response to what you're saying mm -hmm. so if you want to say a prayer with them say a prayer with them if you want to say uh, you know some words of wisdom or counsel to them say words of wisdom and counsel to them mm -hmm. do not think anything is wasted and and you know I'll um, you know I, I can make available to anybody who wants it a whole bunch of articles I have a little summary on the terminal lucidity studies and and a whole bunch of articles in, in various um, uh, medical journals um, as well that uh, that talk about these studies but remember in the case of terminal lucidity mm -hmm. that somebody you know maybe uh, an hour before or maybe even a whole day before they die right. uh, suddenly wakes up now this is a person who you know um, uh, for example you know um, a cat scan reveals you know has almost basically no cerebral cortex functional cerebral cortex right. left mm -hmm. uh, and this includes hydrocephalic pa patients right uh, or you know 90 percent of the of, of the brain is is already atrophied and and so forth well in these patients that have shown virtually no verbal production they one hour before death bingo mm -hmm. they're wide awake uh, you know I, I got to get these arrangements done in my funeral you never believe what what's just happened to me I heard you say this or you know they're all of a sudden speaking normally and they're thinking normally and they're talking about their funeral and they talk about I got to see Joe and I got to see Mary you know I got some uh, making up to do mm. etc cetera, etc cetera. and you're looking at these people going but you don't have a brain mm. how are you saying this how are you thinking this where is this coming from mm. well anyway these these thoughts of terminal lucidity all I'm saying is that soul is being freed from the incapacity of their brain and it's almost as as if for a few brief moments that soul is just kind of working
working its way mm. through the frontal cortex or something right down uh, you know to their vocal cords and 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 they're speaking and, and, and so uh, uh, the frontal lobe excuse right. me and they're speaking uh, very very clearly and and if you didn't believe they had a soul prior to that moment well after you read those studies you will mm -hmm. and I can send you a little synopsis of it uh, along with some uh, articles uh, bibliography of articles uh, if that would uh, help you out okay. but keep praying keep advising keep working with them right. I'm telling you they're hearing you they can react yeah, can... they've got freedom they're, they haven't become non-persons right. And, and I guess the bottom line is you just keep praying and uh, for people and yeah. you let leave it up to the Lord to to work it out with the, the individual. Never give up. You bet. You never know. Here's another you question. Never know. Uh, Dear Father Spitzer, as Catholics, we're told not to play around with or calling on evil spirits because that invites them to be among us and possess us. Yet when we pray for the Holy Spirit to come to us, we don't, do not always sense it. Why don't we? Sam from Texas. Well, Stan, there's a, uh, there's a great question. Well, first of all, the uh, first part of your question about don't call upon evil spirits or something of that mm -hmm. nature. Yes, you're absolutely right. Don't call on evil spirits because they, they have every uh, desire not only to want to come to you, but they have every desire to want to deceive you in every imaginable way mm -hmm. so as to obsess you or possess you. So whatever you do, you're absolutely correct. Don't ever call upon an evil spirit. Never do it. Now, of course, you call upon the, the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit come when you say, come Holy Spirit, enter the hearts of you? Absolutely, the Holy Spirit comes. But it's one thing for the Holy Spirit to come. It's another thing for the Holy Spirit to make his presence manifest. Mm -hmm. Now, why would the Holy Spirit not exactly uh, you know, make his, pres uh, his presence perfectly manifest to you? There's a whole bunch of reasons. The first reason is, is you know God's not going to enslave you to a miracle mm -hmm. so in other words uh, uh, basically the Holy Spirit keeps himself hidden enough so that you can always maintain your freedom mm -hmm. if every time you called upon the Holy Spirit and there the Holy Spirit was y you'd all of a sudden go oh my gosh you know I better not step out of line right in other words all of a sudden your, your freedom is being constrained uh, in a way now you might say I'm a revolutionary and I'll step out of line if I want <laughs> now of course that would be really dumb but uh, I mean the, the point I'm trying to get to is the Holy Spirit does what he must to allow you to be free so that you'll choose what you really want will you choose him or will you choose something other than him mm -hmm. so that's a primary reason why the Holy Spirit uh, you know uh, kind of hides uh, himself or keeps himself uh, you know uh, um, uh, you know a little bit hidden mm -hmm. a second reason that this happens is because the Holy Spirit wants us to be co-participators in the work of salvation right so in other words we gotta exert some effort so of course if the Holy Spirit if you say hey Holy Spirit could you just write this uh, this thing for me and Holy Spirit okay here you go and of course you get all the ideas and you write them down now you got to make some effort. Is that effort, how it works right? for so you? That, that's, that's <laughs> I got it. Well, here's the deal, though. <laughs> I'll tell you this. <clears throat> I do what I I, I have uh, what I call the St. Paul phenomenon, mm -hmm. where you start making the effort and you start, you know, slogging through the evidence. You do all mm -hmm. the reading. You're really working on the thing. You're making the effort. And you go, okay, I got to set pen to paper here, mm -hmm. or I got to set finger to typewriter. I got to start, or a word processor. And so I got to, I kind of, you know, I'm going to make my move. And I'm starting to write those first arduous, you know, paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, because you made the effort, you prepared, you did this work, you wanted to make a difference, hmm. let's say, to, to say something about the Lord or, or something of that nature. And, and so you're making the effort, and all of a sudden, have you ever noticed, it just gets easier and easier and easier wow. and easier, and you're going, gosh, I didn't realize my subconscious mind was that smart. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, but it's not that smart. I mean, it, you're getting help from the outside, but the Holy Spirit is just keeping a distance.
so that you can't be absolutely certain that it's him who's making it easier. But after a while, if you've been through this a few times and you mm -hmm. have a lot of faith and you've seen how the Holy Spirit works in your life and how he guides you and everything else, you'll know who's helping you out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the Holy Spirit. But uh, again, you, you find out about the Holy Spirit helping you because you made the effort, because you have experience of how the Holy Spirit works in the past. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with being guided, right? Now, the Holy Spirit's not going to say, uh, Bob, don't do this, do this, in perfectly articulate language. Mm -hmm. So how does the Holy Spirit work? All of a sudden, you're thinking about two things. And, and it's like, you know, old Saint Ignatius, you know, and in, 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 in his way of discerning the spirits. So you're thinking about, well, should I go to Harvard or should I go to Georgetown or something? Some Catholic, well, maybe uh, should I go to Steubenville mm -hmm. or, or, or some, you know, uh, a place. And you're considering back and forth and back and forth. As you're considering Harvard, something happens to you. All of a sudden, you, you kind of say, Gee, I, I feel a sense of discord or hmm. something's just not, not quite right. It's not saying don't go Bob, yeah. but it's saying something that, that's clearly giving you a sense of discord. And then you think about, okay, uh, let me think about Franciscan or something. Mm -hmm. And then you feel a sense of, you know, peace. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to Harvard and you say, oh, but if I go there, uh, you know, I, I, I get better job possibilities in the XYZ area. Right. Then you go back and you think about students and you go, well, you know, maybe I'd have to, you know, get, uh, you know, some employment in, in, you know, an area which is open to faith or maybe where people are more open to, to my faith perspective. And then you go, but then it get, but as you're discerning this, notice right. what's going on. There's a kind of an interweave of both intuition and feeling that's telling you sort of, you know, go one place, go another. Remember in the Acts of the Apostles, when you're sort of reading about this, right, you know, Paul says, well, the Holy Spirit told us to, to avoid going to this place and to go to this other place. Mm -hmm. So we did. Now, what do you mean the Holy Spirit said? They, they come and say, Paul, don't go to Troas, go to this other place. No, but he's doing it in this way with this right. sense of intuitions and feelings that are woven around the options. Now, does St. Ignatius of Loyola believe that's enough? No, he doesn't. He says, okay, you've got to discern the spirits after the fact. So he gives some things called the rules for the discernment of spirits. So after the fact, so let's say you right. go, you know, well, why I think don't we, I better uh, go to... I think I'm oh, getting sorry. prompted by my own spirit or the prompter <laughs> here to uh, say we got to take a break and you can get a drink and we'll be back with more with Father Spitzer before you get into the rest of those. Again, the heart of Father Spitzer's universe at the intersection of faith and reason. Going to be talking about hell much more ahead on this program. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us as we continue to explore in uh, Father Spitzer's universe. We turn once more to Father Spitzer. Got him a chance to catch his breath <laughs> on explaining uh, <clears throat> how Ignatius saw those ideas in the sense of trying yeah. to discern. And very, very popular, actually, the, the whole idea of using uh, Ignatian uh, spirituality for discerning because a lot of people's major questions over the years I know in books I've done and other things I've worked on with people in the sense of interviews is you know really trying to find out is how do I discern when God is telling me something or when it's my own will and I thought one of the great things yeah. you always said was if it brings you closer to God then maybe it is if it's pulling you away <laughs> then it probably isn't right that's that's a, Ignatius's main test right, right. there. Right. <clears throat> if it's increasing trust in God, hope in your salvation, and love, you know, the ability to love, 
is probably coming from the Holy Spirit. Why would the devil do that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Alternatively, if it's going in the opposite direction, beware. Right. Because, you know, if decrease in trust in God, decrease in hope in your salvation toward despair, mm -hmm. right? Decrease in the ability to be patient, kind, merciful, uh, not angry, etc. Mm -hmm. When you see a decrease in that capacity, uh, probably coming from the evil spirit, why would the Holy Spirit do that? Right. Um, so that's, that's basically his primary test. You're right on. Okay, so uh, one last question, and this is just because it's kind of topical, and since you're out in the mm -hmm. great state uh, of California, and mm -hmm. this has been in the news, and there's been some recent developments, yeah. obviously positive developments, but a person that sent us a question said, Dear Father Spitzer, in relation to recent developments in California law, I understand mm -hmm. the need for the seal of confession, but I find it somewhat problematic in the case of sexual abuse or murder. Could you please explain how this teaching came about in the church? I tried to find info on it in the Catholic Catechism, but didn't find anything. Thanks. And this is from Marianne in Redondo Beach. Yeah, hey, Marianne, <clears throat> let me just give you a quick um, uh, thought. Of course, confession goes uh, back to the very time of Jesus, uh, when Jesus comes and in, in, uh, in the resurrection and and says uh, in John's Gospel, I believe it's uh, John. 2021 is it um, um, and he says uh, uh, you know he breathes on them gives them the Holy Spirit and says whatever sins you forgive are forgiven them whatever sins you retain are retained so right then and there we know that the Apostles are being given this power of uh, absolute uh, absolution and so uh, um, uh, confession begins at that very time and we see uh, in the earliest church fathers uh, that there is you know um, uh, the whole dimension of confession and in the in the case of particularly public sins mm -hmm. um, for example apostasy which was public uh, then um, there was uh, uh, you know recourse to some kind of public penance but it seems uh, right from the beginning Marianne that um, uh, the uh, seal of confession though it's not declared canonically as a seal of confession in in writing mm -hmm. it see, seems seems like that seal was in place. So we don't hear anything uh, about any privately confessed sins mm -hmm. where there wasn't some public dimension like apostasy uh, that, that uh, you know, um, uh, had to be uh, in some sense redressed. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if, given the fact, you know, we judge it from its absence, right? Given the fact we just don't hear anything about anybody's sins and we know there were a lot of uh, confessions going on mm. um, and, and uh, uh, given the fact that we just don't hear anything it, it seems pretty probable the seal was in place mm. now of course this becomes canonically declared oh I guess uh, maybe uh, sometime uh, you know in the in the uh, fourth century there may be a canon associated with it but I just I'm not I don't have my fingers on it. I didn't review this question before mm -hmm. I came on the show, but I would suspect uh, that um, around the fourth century in one of the canons that's coming up at that uh, juncture, mm -hmm. uh, there is some sort of, a, 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 at least a canon about the seal. Now, why did it come about, the second part of your question? Right. Because if it didn't come about, people would never feel like there was freedom to confess to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So let's put the whole argument together. The first part of the argument is Jesus has given the apostles and their successors, namely priests and bishops, right, the power to forgive sins. Okay, now that means th th that absolution, right, people are going to, if they go to the priest or go to the bishop, they can actually get forgiveness, absolution from their sins definitively. There it is in Scripture. Now, in order to do that with some degree of freedom, uh, they have to have some pledge that the priest isn't going to go out and tell the authorities right, in right. two and a half minutes that this person is a murderer or something. So in other words, the church felt it could never put a restriction mm -hmm. on a penitent's freedom to come before the Lord to confess his sins or her sins so that they could be given absolution. Mm -hmm. Ever! There couldn't ever be an exception to this mm -hmm. because the moment there is an exception, 
exception, then of course the slippery slope begins. What do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. So let's suppose uh, SB 360, which is the bill you're referring to, Marianne, let's suppose that SB 360 actually occurred. Now, of course, no priest in their right mind would ever violate their sacred vow mm -hmm. uh, to the seal of confession. So we'd all go to jail, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they put the little plants in our confession, the all autocratic state would just have to take us off to jail because nobody's going to sit there and, and, and report something that they've heard in a confessional. Mm -hmm. But why is this? Why, why say everything and not just a few things? Because, of course, what are the most serious sins, Marianne. That's the first thing. What are the murder, mm -hmm. abuse? These are the most serious sins. But if you prevent, in other words, if you say that, a, uh, that the priest is going to go out and be a mandatory reporter of what he hears in the confessional and going to go out and report this to the authority, how many murders and abuse victims uh, and, abuse, and abusers, excuse me, uh, you know, even though they've done heinous, terrible things, mm -hmm. how many of them who really need the sacrament of reconciliation and absolution, how many of them would ever go to confession? So that's the first point. A answer, zero. Mm -hmm. They're not going to do it. So in other words, you've just cut off at the knees the very prospect of absolution for all those people who are serious sinners. Mm -hmm. And Jesus wanted repentance, even of the most heinous and serious sinners. It's all over the Gospels. So that's the first point. A second point is the slippery slope. And the church, you know, having lived through a million slippery slopes, is well aware of the fact of how the state can operate. We just want you to report abuse, okay? That's SB 360. We're not asking you to report anything else. But then somebody in the legislature is going to come along because now we allowed the violation of the seal to occur. Right. Someone else in the legisl legislature comes along and says, or or the state assembly and says, hey, wait a minute, murder is just as serious, if not more serious than abuse. Well, what the heck? Why are we just restricting it to abuse? We ought to have a mandatory report for abuse. And then somebody else comes along and goes, well, while we're at it, I mean, rape is pretty violent too. Why? I mean, let's just face fact, we ought to have mandatory reporting of rapes. Okay, while we're at it, <clears throat> You know, when you take a look at grand larceny, where they're actually stealing uh, from the poor people or something of that nature, poor people are being deprived of, of their, you know, their whole means. Mm -hmm. uh, they're robbing Catholic charities or whatever and, and so forth. <clears throat> you said, that's pretty awful, too. Why not do What's going to prevent it? Mm -hmm. Nothing is going to prevent it. Once you allow the seal to be broken in one case, you allow the seal to be broken in a myriad of different cases right. because there is no intrinsic limit to what the state can do once they have asserted themselves over the privilege of penitents to come before the Lord in the sacrament to confess their sins and receive absolution. There's no way you can limit it. Mm -hmm. you, you give the state that authority, they'll take that authority and more. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like I said, the church has gone through this a million times. They know whereof they speak, and so they, they're never going to do that. There's a third reason that the church doesn't teach, but of course in the United States that, that's really important important. Mm -hmm. We have this thing called a sacred seal. It's an attorney-client privilege, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. or a psychiatric client, uh, a psychiatrist client privilege, for example. And that, too, it's not a sacred seal, mm -hmm. but it's a, a sacrosanct seal. Mm -hmm. That is to say, if you tell me something as a psychiatrist, or I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but if you tell your psychiatrist mm -hmm. something, in order for the psychiatrist to help you, right, he can't be a mandatory reporter, because if he's a mandatory reporter can he help you no he can't you'll never tell him anything that he has to mandatorily report mm -hmm. so the fact is we say that that person has a privileged communication he does not have to report it right. but if you break it for the church so you say priests have to be mandatory reporters uh, you know so the spiritual help can't be given what's to prevent the state from simply saying well I mean, what's this deal with psychiatrists? Abuse is so serious, psychiatrists 
client trust ought to be mandatory reports of abuse as well. Mm -hmm. Skip that sacred seal. And by the way, murder's bad too, so have the psychiatrist report, be mandatory reporters of that too. So they can't get not only spiritual help, they can't get emotional help. Mm -hmm. And then how about the attorney-client privilege? Let's go there. We say that there is such a privilege so that an attorney can actually help his client. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you don't have privileged communication, will the client ever tell the attorney anything right. which could jeopardize them in an abuse case or jeopardize them in a murder case or whatever the case may be? The answer is no. Right. So the guy can't even get legal help, let alone psychiatric help and priestly help. So why why would we say that this is a bad idea? It's a lousy idea because it prevents people, first of all, from ever getting the spiritual help they need. Secondly, it'll never stop at abuse. Well, let me ask it'll you just a, a question, a question about yeah. that because that, that sure. all makes a lot of sense in how those things, and obviously the Lambert Conference and opening the door to contraception, yeah. unique situation, and suddenly it just means it's fine for everything. Basically, it's so, like you say, once the door mm -hmm. opens, then why not? Yeah. One question would be, somebody might say, well, somebody goes and, and let's say, uh, confesses that they murdered somebody. Now, can uh -huh. they get absolved of that sin without having to go and admit that they murdered somebody? I mean, can somebody go yes. and say, I murdered somebody and just and, and, and be absolved of that? Yes, they could. Of course, a priest could, uh, you know, you'd have to judge whether they were truly sorry mm -hmm. uh, for the sin that they were committing and could uh, establish an appropriate penance. But the priest cannot establish a penance like you have to turn yourself oh, okay. in yeah, because no, that, that okay. would have the same effect of uh, basically, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, the the, conf the penitent will never come to confession mm -hmm. because he's not he doesn't want to turn himself in, so he's not free to come. So if you give a penance like that, you'd, you'd basically undermine his freedom. So no priest will give that penance. It's like the same thing, uh, you know, if if you uh, you know uh, stole something, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes a priest will say, well. You know, if you write a check out, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But instead, why don't you do this? Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you put some uh, cash, you know, into a, a sealed envelope or something of that nature and hand deliver it uh, to the person involved or, you know, mail it in, 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 mm -hmm. in a way, uh, you know, where it, it can be discreetly, you know, um, uh, you know, seen so mm -hmm. that you can make restitution uh, without, you know, divulging who you are. So that's all part of the seal of confession, you, and a priest can't make a person violate uh, the seal, uh, you know, himself, oh, and, and because that really is a violation of the seal. But it's a great question. Okay. I was wondering about that. Okay. Let's talk in the closing yeah. minutes, get into, uh, so to speak, uh, hell, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, is part of our Credible Catholic uh, series here. And uh, mm -hmm. at the beginning of this, uh, you talk about uh, people's decisions. You say eventually those decisions and actions form habits, a second nature that they become stronger and stronger, gradually forming our essence, our self-definition. We don't have to define mm -hmm. ourselves perfectly before leaving this world. What do we mean self-definition? What does that have to do with mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. next step in the afterlife? Well, the reason that Jesus was so adamant, you know, about uh, well, basically, uh, uh, hell. He was adamant about the wailing and the grinding of teeth. The reason is, is because he's giving us a warning. Not that God is going to send us to hell, but that we won't take the wide road to perdition. Mm -hmm. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, look, there's a lot of temptation out there, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and in this century, in our time, there's a lot of temptation out there uh, toward what we might call the eight deadly sins or violation of the commandments, mm -hmm. right? And, and so we can see that, you know, the, the road to perdition is very wide. It's easy to get on, says Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the Deal. You can get on the wide road to perdition. And the longer you remain on the wide road, the more habituated it becomes. Mm -hmm. You start internalizing what it is that 
is giving your life meaning, that's giving you happiness in your life. So if you say, you know, I'm really happy exploiting people, dominating people, and, and, and really happy cheating, stealing, and lying, and I really have a fantastically happy existence when I'm betraying my spouse and doing all these things, it really, you know, life is really worth living. Now, by the time you get to that point, you have made this an identity statement. So let's examine this. How did this happen? You went down the road of perdition and, and you sort of took the, the, the devil's false happiness and false bait and you sort of kind of liked it and then you sort of got into it a little bit more and then sort of, you, you know, it becomes a more important kind of happiness than spiritual happiness and you start noticing, well, I, I just don't want to, I don't feel like going to church that much any often uh, that much um, very often so you, st uh, you stop uh, uh, you know going to church and, and then you stop praying and, and this little voice in the back of your head is starting to go and, and of course the voice in the back of your head is the Holy Spirit going mm. you know stop 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 go into this church go to confession mm. you know uh, you're making a mistake but the voice in the back of your head mm. is trying to urge you it's not gonna urge you against your free will right mm. it's not gonna push you into the church. It's not going to say, Bob, go to church or else. Go to confession or else. But it's going to be urging you. And then you're going to wake up sometimes and you're going to have some dreams. And the dreams are going to be really disturbing. Like you're going downward into a, a black tube or something of that nature. Or you, you know, you're, you're, you have a dream where you, you wake up and maybe the angels are crying or the Blessed Virgin Mary is crying mm -hmm. or something of that nature. And you're disturbed. Or, or or, or you, you, uh, you wake up and you have this feeling of what I call cosmic emptiness, alienation and loneliness, and it's getting more and more profound. You can't even look at yourself in the mirror and, and you're getting these feelings of deep set, uh, you know, emptiness in the pit of your stomach. And, 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 you know, you're sitting there with your whole family and you feel completely lonely in the midst of your family and friends, like something is desperately missing. Or, or you're, you have this sense of not being at home here, that something is radically wrong, not even being at home with yourself, in yourself. When you get cosmic emptiness, alienation, loneliness, when you get the disturbing dreams, when you start getting, you know, this voice in the back of your head mm -hmm. urging you, get off this road, get off this road, it'll never urge you against your freedom, but when you all these things start happening to you, mm -hmm. listen to the voice for crying out loud, because what the voice is desperately trying to tell you, when you have that dream of going down into the black tube or whatever it is, when you have those dreams, mm -hmm. you, you know, there's, you're, the spirit is telling you something. And it's saying, if you keep going down this road, you're going to move first from a temporary happiness to this is my real happiness in life, to this is my purpose in life, and then final stage. This is who I am. This is my identity. And then it's really hard to break the spell. Once you've made it your identity, once you've made it your habitual uh, conduct, it's so hard to turn around. It's so hard to step into that church. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the patients uh, uh, that um, um, uh, uh, Dr. Gallagher, Dr. Richard Gallagher, he, he's writing this book uh, uh, called Demonic Foes, and, and, and he's uh, uh, really a fantastic psychiatrist mm -hmm. uh, who's uh, at the New York uh, 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 University School of Medicine. But anyway, the long and short of it is he's been a, um, a the psychiatric uh, consultant on many an exorcism. And, and the point is that in this one case, Julia, she tries, right, she's been a satanic uh, uh, priestess, mm -hmm. and, and she, she's asking for the exorcism, but then suddenly quits it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly she comes back almost in this desperate last minute attempt and then um, she, she's gone. She, there's uh, no uh, record of what's happened to her, etc. Mm -hmm. But you can almost remember that in an exorcism, still the person being exorcised has to exert free will. Mm -hmm. you gotta, you've got to cooperate with the exorcism. And, you know, if the devil's got a really good grip on you, he never has an absolute grip on you. Mm -hmm. He can never take away your free will. You can always repent. But if you go down that road long enough and hard enough, 
enough, you go down that road and it becomes part of your identity. He's got such a good grip on you that, I mean, he can just beat you out of even going through with an exorcism. You know, he can basically, you know, beat you out of turning your life around and, and starting to pray again and, and starting to go to Mass. So all that I, I'm saying is, you know, you know, the road to perdition is wide. Any one of us can get on it. It's real easy. And, and you know, you, you know, I gave that kind of sarcastic sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, thought of, well, I like, you know, dominating people mm -hmm. and exploiting people, etc. Well, it doesn't start out like that. It's little dominations and little exploitations and things of that nature. But ultimately, what's happening uh, as you're kind of uh, moving along that road is, is it becomes more and more more your purpose in life right. and ultimately more and more of you and, and then the devil has his talents right. and, and you, you almost know, become your hardened and so you become numb even to the fact that maybe yeah. you're acting out the way that you're actually acting out and you don't see yourself that way so with That's that right. being said we're going to have to put hell on hold till uh <laughs> an upcoming show and ask you to in our limited time to uh give us right. your blessing for us Absolutely. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord of all compassion and consolation, who comes to you to call you ever and always to himself, ready to forgive you ever and always, help you and keep you on the road to salvation. May that same Lord dispose your free will to always being open to him, to deeper and deeper conversion and reform, so that as you follow him and are open to him and rely on his mercy, he may take you into the fullness of his life and love forever with the blessed and with himself. In the in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Uh, next week, obviously, we'll be at the Christ Cathedral event. People will see you there. And also, uh, we'll be running one of our uh, pre-tape programs as well. And don't forget that mm -hmm. Father Spitzer, the one and only, his uh, materials are all available through our EW10 Religious Catalog, EW10RC.com, wonderful books. DVDs of programs, and again, as I mentioned, the dedication of the Christ Cathedral Wednesday, July 17th, a preview show at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific Time, dedication of the Christ Cathedral itself at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, 10.30 Pacific Time, so that'll preempt us, but you can watch our replay, and we have more shows coming up, even one we're going to be taping in Napa in a couple of weeks, and of course, the EW10 Family Celebration, Saturday, September 21st in Denver, Colorado, don't forget about that, and uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be talking about the second part of Hell. And also this Sunday, look for a bookmark I did with Rod Bennett about his book having to do with bad shepherds. Quite interesting timing. And speaking of timing, we'll see you next time in the heart of Father Spitzer's universe. I'm Doug Keck. Thanks for joining us.